Bienvenidos a todos a esta entrevista con el señor Jano Bebkur. Eh, les doy la bienvenida a todos. Brevemente, yo soy Brenda Rodríguez, asistente de Relial. Y este evento va a ser en inglés, pero va a poder contar con subtítulos en, en, en español. Y bueno, eh, quiero darle la palabra, por favor, a Silvia Mercado, coordinadora de Relial, para unas palabras. Muchas gracias, Brenda. Buenos días a todos. Es un placer saludarlos en nombre de la Red Liberal de América Latina, Relial, y dar la bienvenida a esta quinta y última conferencia del ciclo Restart, cinco propuestas para la innovación, una iniciativa de Relial en unión y colaboración con la Alianza para Centroamérica. Este programa tiene el propósito de reunir expertos de diferentes campos, quienes nos ofrezcan puntos de vista, perspectivas sobre cómo afrontar el futuro de manera creativa e innovadora. En esta ocasión es un honor contar con el señor Hanno Perkur, quien compartirá con nosotros su experiencia en gobierno digital, innovación, transparencia, entre otros temas. Muchas gracias también a Federico Fernández, de Fundación Bases, uno de nuestros miembros más queridos, también un amigo muy cercano, pero sobre todo un profesional con amplia experiencia en el tema de innovación. Pues bueno, muchas gracias a todos. Aquí estamos listos para disfrutar de una conferencia seguramente muy inspiradora. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for this opportunity to, uh, to be at your conference and, and just to share uh, some of the views, what we have done here in Estonia and uh, why digitalization uh, has been um, a very significant role or has played a significant role in, in Estonian success uh, during past uh, 20, a bit more years. And, and uh, I try to make my presentation in 20, 25 minutes and then we have also possibility for for questions and answers so so as, as far we are starting the slides i will just uh, tell a couple of words of my background so i've been uh, as elected member to parliament since 2007 uh, and uh, have been working in uh, estonian uh, government uh, for uh, more than eight years uh, i started my career uh, in the government uh, as a as a minister of social affairs spending there four years then i moved to the minister of justice and being responsible also for digitation and uh, also then uh, after six years i moved to the ministry of interior and was responsible for the you know, for introducing uh, uh, also here estonian e residency but uh, today i will focus on the main aspects of of estonian digitalization and digitation and uh, for sure i will i will also Uh, show uh, some of the success stories and, and uh, our timeline, how we have uh, improved during these past 20 years, uh, why we made this, these decisions. And, and of course, uh, then also, I will tell you uh, uh, about our lessons learned. So I, I believe that this is also very important that we can all uh, learn uh, from our mistakes and, and uh, not uh, to Uh, not to make the, the same mistakes by others and that also uh, when we move to next uh, uh, next steps then we all can also avoid ourselves uh, the, the mistake so as uh, as you probably know Estonia is a very small country so we have a population of 1.3 million and uh, uh, once I had to make a presentation in the United Nations and I was together in the same panel with IT uh, and development minister of, uh, of India And uh, then uh, I compared that, you know, in India and Estonia are very similar because we both have 1.3. Uh, you just have billion, we have million. Uh, and, and uh, well, uh, obviously this was also uh, uh, one of uh, the keys of our success because we are so small and we can do most of the, uh, of, of the services nationwide. So the territory or the area of Estonia is the same size as Netherlands. So when you compare that Netherlands has 18 million people and we have 1.3, so you can imagine that uh, that uh, the, the area is quite big and we don't have so many people. So this was actually one of the reasons why we started uh, 20 years ago uh, the process of digitation and uh, we had to And we had to move uh, towards uh, these solutions where we can provide different services to people nationwide and, and uh, also considering that we don't have uh, much uh, uh, possibilities to, to say to people that you have to drive all the time. So one, this was like the one of the key factors the, why we started this digitization so fast. 
But on the other hand, uh, Estonia has been all, always very active internationally. And uh, we are uh, the most integrated uh, country in the Northern uh, Europe. Uh, we are a member of the European Union. We are a member of NATO. We are a member of uh, Economic uh, Organization, OECD. And, and also digital nations. So, and, and when we take the ICT sector today in Estonia, then uh, uh, we have almost six, uh, at the moment already, more than 6% of workforce uh, are working uh, uh, in, in ICT sector. So this also gives you a bit of understanding uh, why we are doing so many, so many different uh, solutions digitally here uh, in Estonia. So uh, the, the reasons, uh, why we uh, decided to uh, move to the digitization and then why we wanted to be uh, so successful uh, uh, one is that you know when we were uh, coming from the soviet era and and soviet union era then uh, uh, we saw that uh, we need to provide uh, to, to our people the best services and uh, and uh, we were able to uh, move uh, to uh, leave past uh, all this uh, area uh, or all this era uh, from 80s and and we were able to start from uh, 90s with a totally new approach we changed the government uh, and and uh, when we changed the government then all the governments starting from early 90s have been focused actually to uh, to uh, give people the best service and then we have been lucky actually uh, that our leaderships throughout uh, 30 years have been very digital or very open to digital digitation and uh, this is this is really really important because one of my postulates or one of my key principles has always been that uh, when you when you want to be successful then uh, you have to have uh, also uh, uh, a leadership for that and, and and the political leadership has to back you uh, with all these uh, decisions uh, what you want to do uh, well, uh, what we also saw that uh, when you want to be successful in digitization and, and to, to provide the best services, then uh, you have to introduce for, from uh, day one, uh, once only principle, which, which means that uh, when the government or the state is asking any data uh, of, of, of people, and then uh, you have to do it uh, only once. So when you ask that, where are you living? then this goes to the database and, and uh, all the other uh, state services can, can access to the same database of uh, people's register. And uh, you can see where these people is living. So you just need to, to ask his ID. And uh, what uh, we decided that we want to be a digital state. So we, we, we decided that by default, the first option is digital. And, and now we can say that, you know, 99% of our services are basically accessible online. And, and uh, this, uh, this is a very like useful understanding for, for every citizen that uh, he knows that when he needs something from state, then he can go to state portal and, and uh, find this solution. Or when he goes to any, any other uh, institution, then uh, the, the data is there available. And, and also the uh, pr private sector is uh, doing uh, a lot here to, to help uh, us with, uh, with the digitization. But uh, this I will uh, uh, talk a bit uh, later. So what is... Uh, what is very important when we talk about digitalization, I, 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 tell, uh, I told you already why. So, uh, but now about the principles. So the first principle, what, what we uh, said at the beginning was that we want to be citizen centric. So that we, we don't want to see what or how this helps the government or how this helps the, the, the companies. But first and then foremost, we wanted to see that how this can help our citizens. And, and when we started to uh, create our services, then uh, we, want, uh, we wanted to take the position of the citizen. So uh, when you log in to any kind of system, then you have to be comfortable and then you have to see the services what we have. Uh, uh, the second principle uh, what we had from the beginning was that uh, 
we have to have, or we have to do it together with the private sector. So the public-private partnership was uh, very, very essential. And then we, we had to bring this understanding uh, also to the private sector. And actually it was vice versa because the banks were the ones who started to ask from the government that can we have the, the common identification system for, for citizens because every bank had their own identification for the e-banks. And uh, this was one of the key like uh, uh, striving moments uh, for, for the government also to go on with the services and, and with the e-tax board. Uh, I will explain later and, and, and all the other services that we want to do it together with the private sector. And, uh, and then of course, that means also that when you want to create services for, for the citizens, then uh, you have to have an internet access. Uh, so uh, we we uh, we were putting a lot of energy uh, to bring uh, people uh, internet. Uh, at the moment, of course, it's more and more easy as the five G is already coming. Four G is available almost everywhere in Estonia. So so this means that you know uh, it's uh, it, it makes a lot easier for for all of us to create uh, new services, and uh, and. Of course, always there is a question that how you can protect the data, what, what you own. And uh, we said from the beginning that uh, even when we create the services for the citizens, for the people, then uh, everyone has to know that, that the data is, uh, and the personal data belongs to individuals. So, so uh, when we also talk about opt-in or opt-out uh, options, uh, how, to, how to create different uh, databases, then uh, you always have to know that the data always belongs to the personal. So when, uh, when we talk about, for instance, instance e-health, then uh, every citizen can close their data. Uh, by default, it is open. So this was uh, our choice that uh, we uh, we say to the doctors that uh, as long citizens have not closed their data, it is available for the for the doctors. Uh, when you go to the doctor, then we can see your data. But uh, from this moment on, when you want to close your data, uh, except time critical data uh, as, as the blood uh, type or or uh, something like that or uh, some other time critical data then all the other data you can you can close from the doctor so this just shows perfectly that that uh, the essential point of uh, view when we started creating e-state was that uh, the data belongs to to every individual taking all this into account uh, basically what we decided that that as i said 99 percent of the services at the moment are uh, accessible online and, and that means that you know we, we are digitalizing everything and, and, and of course as we have more and more new services coming to, to the market then we can say that it's the ongoing process but even when, uh, when we have the Christmas time now coming so when you go to, to the forest and, and uh, want to cut your own Christmas tree then I just go to the forest I have my mobile phone I, I will find the tree, I will cut it. And, and at this moment, I can also pay for this uh, online and, and it's not a problem at all. The same with, these, with the fishing licenses, uh, reporting a crime, uh, uh, vehicle uh, history check uh, or uh, roadmaps or whatever other services. Basically, everything is accessible online. Uh, and we have one service. So when you can put to the next slide, slide I believe that's uh, the slide where I can say that uh, uh, there is one service uh, still uh, which is not online and, and, and this is getting married uh, or divorced uh, because we still believe that uh, for getting married, uh, you have to go to the official to say yes or to go to church to say yes. So, so because uh, this is something we cannot uh, do online, but what you can do that you can register your time and to go to the official or to church online, but uh, still this final word to say yes and to kiss your bride, this has to be made uh, still in real life, not online. So, uh, but at the moment, you, you never know what, what's going to happen in the future, but at, at least in this moment, we, we have uh, the services. And, and uh, also when we take the, uh, the, the health crisis we have at the moment, then exactly at the same time when we introduced the, uh, or when, when we had uh, the start of COVID period, then we introduced uh, also the e-notary, which means that you can sell or you can make your testimony uh, also online, and, and uh, this is uh, very, very comfortable that notaries can uh, 
identificate people uh, online because they have the access to the databases uh, and uh, for instance people's register and uh, you can do uh, all the services what the notary has to do you can do online uh, and the same thing what we did during the crisis or the, uh, when the pandemic started we also created uh, the online tool for Estonian parliament uh, the room is what is behind me at the moment and uh, and uh, this was also uh, a very good tool for us that during the pandemic uh, we didn't have to, uh, to close the parliament so we were able to work from our homes and uh, all the decisions all the same services or all the same tools all the same options what we have uh, sitting in parliament every parliament member has also the the, the same rights the same options uh, working uh, from home so uh, even at uh, this moment this week we are working uh, from home and probably we will go back to parliament starting from next week but uh, until today we were working uh, from uh, online so or from from home so uh, and and to to all, to do this uh, all uh, we uh, uh, what is the like the like the starting point uh, for all these services is that you have to identificate people and uh, online and uh, to have this identification i already mentioned the banks so uh, to have this understanding uh, that uh, what what the banks were asking from the government that please give us the tool where we can uh, uh, can identificate people uh, electronically then uh, we introduced uh, electronic id which means that uh, uh, every Estonian citizen has the electronic ID uh, in their pocket. And uh, this is the tool where we can uh, use uh, identification uh, mechanism or identify identificate everyone uh, uh, online. And uh, when we take the numbers, then uh, more than 70% of uh, population uh, is using ID card regularly. Uh, and also the other two options, what we have for identification, like mobile ID and smart ID, then uh, these options are, are also available uh, for identification as, as new methods. And uh, I, I don't have enough time to talk about e-residency today, but e-residency is mainly uh, focused for uh, international uh, businessmen or, or uh, people who want to make business internationally. And the, the very simplified uh, explanation to e-residency is that you will have an Estonian e-residency. And for instance, when you have a, a multi national company where the offices are in um, in Chile, in, in uh, United States, in London, in, in Germany, in Tallinn, then you can have everywhere, uh, and this company is registered in Estonian business registry, then you don't have to travel to Estonia to uh, provide the documents for the uh, business register, you can all sign your documents uh, online uh, using Estonian e-residency. So, but, but this is not the, the only op uh, tool or the only option what you can uh, do with, with the residency, but, but this is something we introduced in 2015. So I, I will now uh, go uh, just uh, quickly through the process. Uh, when, we, when you identificate yourself, then uh, this is a very simplified uh, uh, picture of, of our X road. And this is actually the, the spinal core of Estonian uh, e-state because uh, the X road means that all the services, public services and private services are linked to each other via X road. So, and, and that means that when the, when you go to have an e-prescription, then uh, for instance, 99% uh, of the prescriptions in Estonia are, are um, issued electronically, then that means that uh, for electronic prescription or for a prescription to have a drug, you need to go to the people's register, you have to go to the uh, you know, drug register, you have to go to the insurance, uh, health insurance. Uh, so in total, seven different registers and, and all these registers are linked to each other with uh, or via X road and, and also when you go to bank then uh, the private services are using the X road so this is basically the the spinal core of Estonian e-state that where all the different services are using the X road to communicate with the, with uh, uh, each other and, and and this allows 
uh, uh, the, the companies and the state to change the data. And this also allows to uh, uh, have the understanding that you don't have to put all the databases to one uh, spot, but every uh, database will uh, be in, in the possession of the data owner and uh, just the data is uh, inquired through different, uh, different uh, uh, databases. And, and uh, we are just to, to understand also, we are talking about a lot about the, the green economy and, and at this moment, where it, this is very important that we have the sustainability. Then uh, as you can see here, so we are saving 3 million working hours annually. Uh, with uh, this solution, uh, we are using uh, in this database uh, 3,000 different services or uh, via X road. And and uh, when we take the transactions, uh, then uh, one, more than 1.3 billion transactions are do, uh, are done uh, yearly uh, uh, using the X road. So, uh, but but just uh, the green thinking uh, is also very important for us that we we understand what is the what is the uh, value of, of X-Road and then these services. And that, as you can see, uh, our uh, principle has been uh, uh, taken over already in many, many other countries like Azerbaijan, Argentina, Cambodia, uh, Colombia, El Salvador, uh, Faroe Islands, Finland, etc. So, uh, so as you see that, uh, that uh, this understanding how to link different services and different uh, databases uh, using the X-Road uh, principle. This is spreading in the world uh, quite widely. So uh, these slides I will go through very quickly. Uh, this just uh, shows you the uh, timeline of, of e-Estonia. So the first service uh, from uh, where it all started was actually the e-tax board. And uh, we, we understand in one, uh, understood in one moment that uh, to, to, to collect the uh, taxes, the best way is that when you give the people the possibility to declare the taxes uh, so comfortably that they don't have to go to the tax board, they don't have to make uh, the declarations online and, and pre-filled tax, the tax declarations and pre-filled data is something we need. And then uh, in actually in already in 1999, uh, we introduced the e-tax board and uh, it was a huge success. So today, 97% of all decl declaration, tax declarations, physical tax, 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 uh, physical uh, tax declaration, sorry, uh, the individual's tax, tax, tax declarations and company's tax, tax declarations are made electronically. And our tax uh, cap is very, very small uh, uh, thanks to that uh, solution. So the same year, to, uh, 1999, uh, 2000, we introduced the e-cabinet. So, and, and uh, then we started to move on. So X-Road came from 2001, then uh, e-school, uh, so all the data, I, I, as a parent, I can see all my data about my kids in the school. What are they missing the lessons or not? What grades they got, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this was all introduced already almost 20 years ago. The same with the digital signature ID card already mentioned. So ASTE.ee is the is the state portal, and all the state services are there. So anything you need to make an inquiry about your your own data or even and when I go to uh, st.ee and I want to see that who has looked my data, then I just can have it uh, this information with one click that I can see that who has looked uh, my data from different databases. So and, and when I make an inquiry today, then I can see that a couple of notaries and police has looked my data and I can always ask them, why did you do that? So uh, next slide, please. Uh, this just uh, continues the timeline. So as you see that I voting, so we started the electronic voting in Estonia in 2005 already. And today we have, uh, I have uh, next uh, one slide uh, where we have also the numbers, but uh, uh, majority of the votes uh, is coming already today um, uh, by electronic uh, vote. So the same with e-notary. E-notary we introduced in 2006, but as I said, that online uh, uh, confirmation we started from, from this year. Uh, this was extra tool for that. E-notary means also that the notaries don't have to make uh, the inquiries because before that it was a very long process to ask from the state portal, to ask data from the, uh, uh, from the different, uh, uh, different databases, it, it took uh, a lot of time. That, so e-prescription I introduced in 2010 
So the next steps, what we are doing at the moment, so we, we started already with AI, our AI, so uh, artificial intelligence strategy, and, and uh, we, we try to, we try to uh, also continue with the cross-border uh, solutions. We have uh, e-prescription, uh, which is valid already today in Finland, in Lithuania. And when our people are working in Finland, they have the prescription from Estonia, then they can go to Finland's uh, pharmacy and buy that out. E-governance is one of the key digitalization topics in Estonia, and it comes in many forms. As a start, the Estonian government completely discarded the old paper document-based decision-making system in the year 2000, all in favor of an innovative digital system called e-cabinet. Nowadays, the session hall is free of any stationary electronic devices and politicians can use their own portable devices like laptops and smartphones. But how would they log in? Well, just like the rest of us, via ID card or mobile ID. They can see upcoming meeting agendas and also give preliminary votes on topics before the meeting. Topics that don't face preliminary objections won't even be debated anymore and instead get adopted by default at the beginning of a session. That way the average session time was cut from around 4 hours to 30 minutes and this led to the creation of paperless parliament. So since government representatives could vote online, the mindset started to change. Five years later, iVoting was implemented and enabled citizens to cast their votes online for regular elections, be they local, national or European as well. Estonians can vote online since 2005 and Estonia was the first country in the world to have used nationwide iVoting in binding elections. How does iVoting work? Well, you need to download the free voting software, have an internet connection and your ID card or mobile ID. Let's try it on this laptop. So I click on ID card, then enter my PIN 1 to get authenticated. Here I have a selection of the different parties. Let's pick a candidate who is running in my district. Then I confirm my choice and enter my PIN 2, the digital signature. Once that is done, I have officially cast my vote. Let's scan the QR code to see if my vote has arrived correctly at the voting server the way I gave it. However, my vote and the status of my participation are always divided. This system also allows me to change my vote during the i-voting period, which effectively means that I can never be forced or bribed to vote for a certain candidate, which makes it a lot more secure than postal voting could ever be. Moreover, the average cost of a vote cast online is a lot lower than that of a physical vote. And of course, it's also convenient, which is why more and more people use it. I-voting is frequently used by elderly people who otherwise might not be able to physically go to polling stations. Digitalization also helps to verify the validity of civic policy efforts such as proposals and petitions. Most online petition portals suffer from the fact that they use email and IP addresses to verify users. But if you use a VPN to alter your location, you can create as many email accounts and as many signatures on the petition as you want. In Estonia, platforms like the Citizen Initiative use the digital signature so we can use participatory budgeting and include citizens into decision-making processes. But when we talk about e-governance, the biggest question in the room must be how all these services are available to the average Estonian. The state portal, ASTI.ee, serves as a portal for most digital services that we can access online. First, I need to authenticate myself with the familiar options. ID card, mobile ID or smart ID. Once that is done, I have access to services covering topics like healthcare and pensions, doing business, education and leisure. This website helps me find out which of my medical prescriptions are still valid, when my car is due for the next technical inspection, how I can create a company in less than 30 minutes, and how to update my digital fishing license. Beyond this, I can also see from the data tracker who has accessed my data, when and for what reason. In Estonia, this is called the truth by design approach. We also have certain services bundled into so-called life events that make those situations easier when you would usually have to get in touch with several government authorities or registries. As you can see, the online services in Estonia are very user-friendly and generally easy to understand so that groups that might otherwise be at a disadvantage, for example the elderly, people who have spent few years in the education system or people with disabilities, are not left behind on the path to digitalization. And this was a crucial realization for the Estonian government. Almost no one truly rejects digital solutions. They just have to be good solutions. 
An online service that is exactly as complicated as the offline alternative will not get many people excited. But if the online service truly solves a problem for citizens, then it will gain traction. The first service was brought online in 1999, and indeed, it solved a big problem for many people. It was the online tax declaration. By now, people can declare their income tax within three minutes and a few simple clicks. This service, the solution itself, was incentive enough and got many people interested in the other digital services that followed soon after. Going beyond simply user-friendly services, Estonia is also working on what we call proactive governance. What does that mean? Well, even though most services are available quite conveniently online for Estonians, it is still ultimately the citizen that approaches the state for a certain service. Proactive services aim to reverse that logic so that the government approaches you when it knows that you are entitled to a certain service. For example, when my doctor registers the birth of my child, I automatically get access to child benefits and other support measures to which I am entitled. Proactive services are particularly powerful in situations where a large majority of the population chooses one option over another. So if 99% of people want child support and 1% does not, then that 1% should be the ones contacting the government to inform them about that decision, not the 99%. In such cases, the benefits of saving time are self-evident and the Estonian government is working on providing such services as we speak. As you can see, e-governance is another one of those topics which show us how the path of digitalization never ends, because there are always new options and solutions that can be implemented. Yes, I will now just uh, have uh, three more slides very quickly. So uh, just to sum up with e-governance, so uh, just understand that uh, uh, this was a strategic choice for Estonia. So, so uh, as I said, you have to have a political leadership and then uh, when you make this strategic choice, then you can also move on uh, with the services. Uh, and and uh, we have to understand that, uh, that it has to be also supported by digital, digital identity. Uh, we have to have secure data exchange and, and uh, of course the databases itself, they have to be uh, very, very uh, high quality uh, databases. So uh, for us uh, has always been a very uh, crucial that uh, we have the transparency which comes with the e-services. Uh, because uh, we, I always say that, you know, when, when when we talk about data protection and transparency, then it's very important to understand that I always bring this example that when, I, when my medical data is stored in, in the file on paper, and, and then I never know how many copies of that has been made. When it's stored electronically and someone uh, will make an inquiry or look for this data, then I see immediately. And, and uh, we have fired a couple of policemen, for instance, when uh, for, for their misuse of databases. And then also uh, you cannot use uh, someone's medical data without uh, a trace. So there is there there will be always a trace, and this uh, brings the, to to the topic that it's it, it gives transparency and gives the security for for the uh, for the pe uh, people uh, we, we always have to have or bear in mind that uh, when you create services uh, online then they have to be user friendly and and you have to involve people uh, for for the decision making processes also and uh, i mentioned already data protection and uh, this uh, once only principle uh, i already explained so when we go oh. to the next slide please uh, then uh, just uh, by facts, uh, at the moment, as I said, 99% of the public services are online accessible uh, and, and the biggest uh, use or the, 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 the biggest success, I would say, is tax declaration and, and also medical prescription. 99% uh, of the medical prescriptions or 98 uh, are prescribed uh, today electronically. And uh, as, as a whole, uh, majority of people uh, are actually satisfied and happy with the public use services, which is a great success considering that sometimes people are not happy with the governments. But here we talk about not the government, but the, but the state services and with these are, are people happy. Uh, we say, I, I said already the usage of the ID card and uh, when we talk about elections, then uh, as you see that uh, almost uh, half of the votes uh, uh, was given electronically and 
just by facts that uh, we are number one today in the world uh, as a freedom of net index and uh, our uh, e-government is ranked third uh, in the in the latest un e-government survey and uh, just uh, as a fact uh, eight uh, on on the index economic uh, freedom globally and third in in europe but uh, and and now the last uh, slide of mine uh, just takes uh, or concludes with uh, with the lessons learned and just uh, to remind again that uh, you have to have a clear and strong uh, political leadership for the for the e services uh, my suggestion has always been that uh, when you explain something pe to people uh, why you are doing this keep it short and simple so when when you say uh, what are the benefits and uh, then then it works uh, better uh, as i said transparency is very very uh, crucial uh, and and when we talk about databases i explained that uh, during the uh, X-Road uh, slide that uh, you have to have uh, uh, shared platforms. Uh, these works uh, quicker and, and you don't have any or you don't have much problems uh, when when the data owners are keeping also the platforms and databases uh, in a good shape. Uh, service design, basically it's the same with uh, keep it short and simple. That, so you, you have to keep uh, or you have to bring the citizen approach or the, the client's approach to that. Uh, keep the public-private partnership and stakeholders' interests. So I will put uh, this together and I will give you a, a good example of why medical prescription uh, is so popular in Estonia because everyone uh, are uh, benefiting from this. So uh, the doctors are benefiting from that. Uh, basically, you can uh, also prescribe uh, when, when your patient is uh, calling you. Uh, the pharmacies are happy, the citizens are happy, the state is happy. So all the stakeholders are happy with, with this solution. Uh, I, I can also bring you one solution, what was not so successful, which is the uh, uh, X-Road, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, pictures what are uh, like M MRT and CT uh, pictures, which are made in, in the hospitals and X-ray pictures, which are made in hospitals, because as every picture is paid by Estonian health insurance, then the hospitals were not happy with that, that, that we had the transparency between in the hospitals and and uh, they, that is why the hospitals were not happy and this service didn't start as well as the medical prescription so you so this just gives you an understanding that you always have to add all the stakeholders on board to be successful with the with these services uh, so as less you have restrictions the better the services are working and uh, when we talk about uh, the X-Road, then the X-Road is a very good example that uh, you don't have to think uh, that you are uh, creating something for, for uh, your use only. Just think globally. And, and this, uh, this gives you more advantages also for, for your own future. And uh, last but not least, simple is always uh, beautiful. So my last slide uh, is the next one. And uh, this uh, just uh, uh, sums up everything. And, and uh, well, as we have seamless uh, for the future, we, we want to have uh, seamless e services available 24 uh, 7, which was also uh, brought to you in, in the short video that uh, we, we are changing the, the understanding that the state is contacting the citizens, not uh, vice versa. And uh, we all have to understand one thing: that digital world is not the uh, world is not the future. It is part of our uh, everyday life already today, and and we just need to cope with that and, and uh, work uh, in this direction to to give people uh, the best services we 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 can. So, just uh, to conclude, there is no option uh, of not uh, making a decision. So you have to make a decision now, and then and, and to start. Uh, building uh, the better future uh, for for our citizens in in all our countries so thank you very much you can find more information in eestonia.com and of course uh, i'm always uh, available for for contacts if you have any questions or i can uh, bring you to the people who can uh, give you the best best answers regarding estonian uh, uh, e-state so thank you very much for listening and now i'm ready to to answer all the questions Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bebkur.
for this interesting presentation. I will give you now the floor to Mr. Federico Fernandez to continue with the interview. So uh, Federico, please. Well, hello, Brenda. Thank you. And then hello, Mr. Pepcur. It was great uh, listening to your presentation. There's a lot, you know, to, to talk about. Uh, probably, you know, we won't have time to, to discuss about everything. I would like to start with the following question. You mentioned several times during your uh, during your speech and at the at the at the at the end as lessons learned the importance of of leadership. And you mentioned that Estonia in the last thirty years has had a very digitally minded uh, political leadership. What what do you think are the reasons for that? Do you think is in, is in part some sort of reaction to what used to be the, the, the system that Estonia suffered before the, the, the independence was regained in 1991? Or why do you think that during these three decades of, of Estonia recovering its independence, uh, the leadership has been so committed to digitalizing the, the nation? Thank you very much for this interesting question. So first of all, I, I have two like reasons for that. I believe that this is my point of view. First of all, uh, we have had uh, here in Estonia a common understanding that uh, not uh, looking who is in the government or who is in the coalition or who is in opposition, we have like three areas where we have the common understanding. So one is defense policy. So we all understand that we, uh, what means to keep your independence and, and how you have to fight for that and you have to put uh, focus to that. The second is foreign policy. So, to, and we have said from the early 90s that uh, we want to be a very integrated country and uh, we want to be a part of European community. We want to be a part of NATO. And, and uh, we, our, one of the slogans were, was that uh, never alone again. So, which means that uh, these two have been like the, the key like railways for us uh, for, for, the, for the future. And, and I would say that the, the third pillar of that was digitalization. And why I'm saying that is that uh, every politician is all also just a citizen. First and foremost, we are citizens. So uh, when I can use as a politician, I can use these services uh, which make my help easy or my life easier or with, which uh, help to live my life. Uh, then uh, I would like to also to put uh, more energy to, to uh, move uh, towards uh, new goals. And, uh, and, this, uh, and, and uh, I believe that also we had, have had the luck from the early 90s to have uh, quite young people in our government. So our first prime minister after the independence war was just a couple of years over 30 when he became a prime minister. And since that time, we have always had very progressive, very young people in, in our government, and we see the advantages. So when every one of us uh, sees the advantage of digitalization, then you are uh, more than happy also to, to, to continue the road which have been uh, built uh, by previous or uh, by, by former uh, governments. So I believe that, you know, the, uh, the, as I said also uh, in, in my presentation, that most important is that, that show the benefits for everyone. So when you show the benefits for each citizen, then you can also show the benefit for a politician. So, and then when you can do something which uh, are most welcome by citizens, then you can also wait for a better uh, election result. So it's 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 maybe a circle of like of life, but uh, the, I still believe that you know one of the main reasons was that you know we are first and foremost still everyone, even even the politician. I, I know that it it uh, might uh, uh, you know look uh, strange, but still uh, all the politicians are also citizens. Indeed, yeah, yeah, and. Well, there are several things, particularly with governance, that, that I also want to, to, to discuss with you. But, but before that, you mentioned it briefly during your presentation, and I think it, it, it needs a little bit more of, uh, you know, we, we can talk a little bit more about, about it, which is an excellent initiative that this year is, is turning seven, which is the, the e-residency. And the e-residency, you were mentioning this, let's say, this ambition of Estonia of being a global uh, country, and it's definitely a declaration of, of intent. What can you tell us about it? How, how do you see the, pro, the program after seven years and how do you see the future developing for it? 
Yes, I was. I was. Uh, I'm honored to be the minister of uh, of uh, e, uh, e residency. At the time, it was introduced. So uh, when we introduced that, uh, then uh, the the aim was to to get 10 million e residents. And uh, I still believe that this aim has to be there. So you have to have big goals to to achieve something. So when you say that, okay, let's have 1,000 e residents that doesn't ring a bell to, to everyone. So you have to put uh, uh, like high goals. And uh, at the moment, of course, uh, we were, uh, or we are seeing that uh, some of the people as always with all those global services want to misuse the residency, but uh, in general, the, the service has been very successful. And uh, we, we really see that uh, this helps to make Estonia bigger. And, uh, you know, as, a, as an international business hub, uh, it's, it's one of the options that, as I said, that when uh, a global company who has uh, offices in Hong Kong, uh, in, in Buenos Aires, in, in uh, New York and in London, they have uh, to sign any kind of papers, then please, please use the residency. You can save a lot of money not flying all the time in business class. You can just uh, use our e-residency for signing the documents. And, and as the uh, registration of the company takes in Estonia 18 to 20 minutes, uh, which is also like legally approved company. I'm not talking about that you are uh, creating a company in notary and, and then it takes time to be in the court system. But in Estonia, the record still is 18 minutes to establish a company. Then uh, we can all understand that uh, this, uh, this is uh, the future. Uh, I believe that this is one of the, one of the key uh, factors for the future business that you know, all the businesses will be global. And uh, it is not important to have in, in, in one spot all the offices or the headquarters. So you can have as many headquarters uh, in the world as you want. So uh, I, I believe in e-residency and, and I believe that, you know, um, growing uh, for uh, growing of e-residency is one, uh, just uh, one next step. And, and it's like, I would say that e-residency is like a startup. You, if we started like small, 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 and then in one moment it, uh, it, it goes uh, global and, and it just uh, takes uh, a couple of more years, but it's as always, it was like with Angry Birds, you know, the one Finnish crazy guy started with a small uh, uh, video game or small application uh, uh, called Angry Birds and it was one of thousands. And in one moment, it just boomed, and and it's the it's the same with the residency. So a couple of countries are copying it already, and and now it's the battle of uh, environments. Yeah, in, indeed. And well, speaking of environment and, and 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 how Estonia makes it easy for entrepreneurs, for people who want to start a business, both from Estonia and from abroad, thanks to initiatives like the like the one of the residency. Another, let's say, I would say cornerstone of the Estonian success of, of the last 30 years is the tax system that you have that according to the tax foundation is the most competitive tax system in the, in the OECD countries. Yes, it's true. And, and this is also one of the, uh, like the key elements of, of the entire business environment. So, uh, yes, we have a very simple uh, tax uh, system, although uh, when we had uh, a couple of uh, years ago uh, governments, which is uh, more left wing, and then uh, they changed it uh, a bit, but still the main principle for the business stays the same. So when, uh, uh, when you invest your money back to your company, then the income tax is exactly zero. So, and this is the most uh, important that uh, we don't have the income tax for the companies. Only when you take the dividends, then you have to pay income tax. But uh, as long as you are growing your company uh, constantly, then you don't have to pay income tax. And, and, and definitely, you know, when we put together the, the tax system, when we put together the uh, establishing the company and, and also managing your company and running your company, then uh, definitely one of the best uh, environments to have a business uh, also at the moment uh, together with the residency to have the headquarter here in Estonia even you know producing something in in Chile or or Argentina or uh, uh, Cuba or or whenever uh, 
wherever, then then uh, this is the possibility at the moment globally to establish a company here here in Estonia. Yeah, indeed, and and I mean, you were mentioning this idea of th this citizen centric governance, and in a sense, I think the Estonian uh, tax policy is, is that applied to taxes in the way that if you are starting a company, usually when you let's say when and you know, particularly young people or whoever want to start a company, it's not that they have 100 potential clients lined up and saying, hey, please start a company and we'll start paying you immediately. So at least you run a lot of risks being an entrepreneur, but at least you don't have to pay the, to, to pay the state in order to exist. First you make money and then you pay, not the other way around, which is like basically how is it in, in many countries in the world, most of them. Yes, and, and not only that, but uh, at, uh, what, what you can do here in Estonia, you can establish a company with zero uh, in, uh, like input. So you don't have to have any money for that. So, so basically what we say that even the, the share uh, uh, or the stocks or the share, what you have to have at, uh, to, to establish a company, you don't have to have it. So with zero dollar or zero euro, you can establish a company, and then uh, in a certain amount of time, you 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 will establish also the the capital for for the company. So this is very important to to understand that yes, uh, when everyone uh, when someone wants to establish a company, please you are more than welcome to do that and and take the risks later. So uh, we, we try to put uh, uh, the understanding also in our schools that being an entrepreneur is, is a normal thing to do. But uh, of course, uh, it's, it's not so easy. And, and globally, we see that you know, still about approximately 10 to 50% of uh, young people want to be an entrepreneur. And uh, sometimes when I go to schools to explain that to, to young people, then I will ask normally that, okay, how many of you want to be an entrepreneur? And when, they, when I see 10 to 15% of, of hands, then I say to the others that, uh, hey, now look around, these people are the employers for you in the future. So then, oh, it's, it's not possible, but, but this is the truth. So uh, in, in the government system, you don't have much uh, workforce and most of the people are still working in, in, the, in the labor market, uh, in, uh, in private companies. Indeed. And well, speaking of, of being an entrepreneur in, in Estonia, Estonia has, if, and please correct me if I'm wrong, has seven technological unicorns and it's the country that has the highest per capita uh, rate of, of unicorns in, in, pro, in Europe and probably in the world. How, let's say, how, how, how have you seen that process? How, how does it make you feel as, a, as, as an Estonian and as, as someone who is involved in politics? And, and how does the, the, the society uh, is related to this? Yes, of course, we are very proud of all these businessmen and especially all, most of them are very young. So when we go back in time, actually, also Skype was invented in Estonia. So many uh, that, uh, yes, the investment came uh, from Nordic countries uh, uh, and, and from Sweden, but uh, the inventors and, and the and programmers, actually, uh, the IT people were from Estonia and, and they, they benefited a lot when they sold this to Microsoft. Uh, at the end, but but yes, to to start actually the uh, success story of Estonian ICT sector, I would say that yes, the the first uh, bird was uh, Skype, but then already Bolt and Transferwise and and the other unicorns. So at the moment, uh, of course, all these unicorns unicorns uh, they are working globally, and and this is also when you remember my presentation. So this was one of my like lessons learned that think globally. But, but also when I take all these unicorns, uh, which have uh, started their uh, business here in Estonia, they also benefited from uh, the simple tax uh, system and, and also establishing a company and all these e-services what we had. Because when we take uh, the mobile parking or uh, uh, transferring uh, bank account or money to bank account or whatever other services. This was so easy. And then when we take transfer wise, this basically grew up uh, from, from the understanding what we had here uh, between the big banks. And then they saw the obstacles, what you have transferring money uh, in, in, in big banks. And that is why they created transfer wise, which is now wise. And then also when we take the, the taxi uh, company Bolt, 
uh, or the sharing uh, platform than uh, we see today already also, which was a boom in, in our uh, uh, pandemic time. Uh, Bolt Food came into the market as Bolt. So all these services, you know, as always, when, when the, there is a gap or there is a need uh, on the market, then someone will fill this gap. And, and exactly, I believe that uh, uh, our young businessmen, they, they understood and, and they, they felt that uh, what is missing on the market. And that is why they, they created this. And that is why we are so uh, proud of them that uh, we have so many unicorns today, uh, which were uh, established here in Estonia. Yeah, indeed. And you have, I mean, like this virtuous cycle that, you know, an easy, easy, easy governance, easy taxes cr created the environment for, for these entrepreneurs to grow. And then now you have in Estonia this, this magnificent uh, phenomenon that, you know, the name can be misleading, the, the so-called Estonian mafia, all these very uh, successful entrepreneurs who are nurturing future entrepreneurs from, from the country. Unfortunately, Mr. Pepkur, we are running out of time and I have only time for one more question. I'll make a little bit of a trick and I'll ask you two questions in one and we will wrap up. And it, it's been a pleasure talking to you and I thank Relial for, for this opportunity. And of course you. My, my last question is the following. It, it has to do with the, let's say, with the, 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 the political system and the state. The first is, with all these possibilities, particularly I voting and all the and, and how this is growing, do you see? Are there discussions at least of Estonia to go to a system of direct democracy or referenda as as as, uh, as there are in there is in in Switzerland, for instance, since it's so easy that you can vote basically from your from your cell phone. And the second one, what are the the measures the state tries to put in order to never overreach because that's you know the constant problem let's say both with the state and with technology that sometimes it can go like too far and you know go so that's my last two-part question yes no now it takes one hour to explain that uh, so uh, first of all uh, regarding the uh, direct democracy and, and uh, uh, possible referendums uh, we have a clear understanding or clear instructions in our constitution. So what we can put to referendum and, and how you can put the questions to referendum. So basically we have two options. Uh, my background as a lawyer, so that's why I'm saying that it takes now one hour to explain that, but very simplified. So we have two options. One is that you just ask opinion from the people and this has no legal consequences. So uh, this uh, we, we can do either via referendum or via just question. So, so basically there is no difference to, you know, to take the opinion from the people. But uh, the other option is to put something to referendum uh, as, a, as a bill, uh, as, a, as a possible law uh, proposal. And uh, when this uh, doesn't go uh, or with, when this doesn't take, uh, get 50% uh, of the votes of the people, then the parliament has to resign. So this uh, just you know keeps back the politicians to to play with the idea of referendums. So basically, when we put something to referendum to ask people, then as we have the direct democracy and 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 and, uh, and we 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 still believe that the parliament has to take the decisions. So so the the aim of the uh, democracy is that. Uh, that uh, the parliament will take the decisions. So when you put every question to the referendum, then uh, then the understanding of uh, of that kind of democracy will be changed, and uh, that means that uh, you have to think through very carefully what you put to the referendum. So that is why we we have had uh, just uh, four referendums. Uh, one was to uh, uh, to uh, take the constitution. Uh, one was to change the constitution regarding the European Union. Actually, uh, regarding the constitutions, we had two. And then one was to uh, uh, to join the European Union, and the last one uh, was uh, also to uh, uh, to change the constitution regarding the Estonian language. So, uh, so that shows that. The, all the politicians, they have to be very careful with the referendums and, and uh, to understand that, that uh, we have parliament and we have parliamentarian democracy. So uh, direct democracy is, yes, possible, but 
we have to be uh, understanding or we have to understand that it has also the consequences. So uh, that is why, yes, it is easy to put something to referendum, but the uh, constitution gives the clear like limits what you can put to the referendum. And uh, now just going over this imaginable uh, red line. Uh, yes, it is very tempting to do that, but uh, to, to be uh, frank and to be clear, uh, I don't see that threat at this moment uh, as we have uh, very like, good constitution it has served us for 30 years and uh, the constitution uh, also gives us the uh, uh, the possibility or the gives us the right uh, the, the legal chancellery or the president to stop any stupidities or to to say that now the parliament has gone over the limit or or uh, some other uh, you know uh, strange uh, when, when parliament let's let's say so when parliament goes to not then uh, the the legal chancellor or the president or the supreme court uh, has the handbrake in their hand to say that this is the limit we cannot go over this so i believe that they, in in that sense estonian constitution has served us very very well i i truly believe that we have one of the most modern but still very good constitution which serves us uh, and uh, of course, we have had debates from time to time, uh, but uh, especially in the last years when the populism is growing everywhere in, in the world. But uh, still, I believe that uh, the, the mechanism uh, which have been set uh, in Estonia are preventing uh, from these stupidities. So thank you very much, all of you. Uh, I'm open for, uh, for follow-ups and, and if you need any kind of uh, clarifications or, or um, some more information, then uh, my email is easy, uh, easily fi findable or easy to find in, in the internet. And uh, please ask the questions or if I can help to improve uh, your country's um, systems or to... to uh, put some more uh, entrepreneurship or, or also uh, uh, forward thinking uh, approach to, to all of you, then I'm more than happy to do that. Once again, thank you very much, Mr. Pepkur, and of course, uh, Federico, for this interview. I will hand over to Siegfried Herzog, uh, Regional Director of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation. Uh, for Thank some closing remarks, uh, please, uh, Mr. Herzog. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Mr. Pevko, for this excellent presentation. Um, as closing remarks, I would try to look at what do we learn from this. I think, obviously, uh, Estonia has established itself as a leader, as a global leader in digitalization. And, it, and in that sense, it shows us uh, the future or the, op the possibilities, the opportunities that are there and that are indeed, as you, as you mentioned, in a sense, unavoidable because digitalization uh, is uh, more and more becoming part of our life. We are in a major transition, like from steam engine to, or from steam power to electrical power. Um, as an economist, I would say, this is another Kondratiev. We are uh, we're reordering our, our world at the moment. Um, of course, Estonia is also a special case. It had the, um, on the one hand, uh, the difficulty, but also the opportunity to start from scratch when it um, when it got formed again as, a, as an independent state after decades of Soviet dictatorship. So it could um, design systems from scratch and um, was less restrained by, let's say, forces of status quo. And in that sense, uh, but in that sense, it shows what is what is possible. What is important, I think what we learned from it, one is um, you need a committed leadership and, in, and Estonia has been blessed with uh, several decades of committed liberal leadership because uh, a transformation of this type is um, probably 60% um, political leadership and 40% tech, uh, technology uh, or technical work. Um, and this is actually um, even more important when you have to fight entrenched status quo interests, something that Estonia probably had had to do a bit less. Um, what are important elements? As you mentioned, um, one 
one part is building a system that is transparent and open. That is something that is crucial for democracies, that people, um, that the system becomes more open, that um, people ha uh, have the feeling that they know what's going on. Um, but the other is also that I, what I took away is that Estonia took a decision to have really an open source infrastructure, that the backbone of the system is open source, it's accessible to all, it does not allow proprietary company interests uh, to control the vital backbone, the vital infrastructure. I think this is um, important in, uh, also for the debate in Latin America, um, where sometimes there's a, there's a hesitancy or uh, there's a debate about the proper role of the state. I think keeping such a vital backbone infrastructure open and uh, accessible to all is the, the vital function of, of the government and the vital uh, element of building an, uh, a truly competitive system. Um, the benefits of, of this, um, why should we do this? One is indeed this allows us to make things easier for the users. And I think this is really crucial. Um, you described several examples. Um, I would just mention the child support system that, uh, that you get automatically once you register the birth of a child. Um, that the system has to be designed from the point of the user and from the point of view, make things easier, make things simpler. This is, I think, a philosophy that in most of our countries, whether it's in Latin America or, or in my native Germany, is something that the bureaucracy is not very comfortable with. Um, so usually systems are designed for the benefits of uh, the bureaucrats and not for the benefits of the, of the users. This is, I think, a crucial change in perspective that we need to take on board. Um, but the second is also that such an open system lowers transaction costs. It um, allows, as I mentioned, more transparency. And those are, uh, and of course, crucially, it also takes away discretionary decision-making power. Uh, it takes away obscurity, and that means it lowers corruption. So these are important ingredients for better economic growth and more equitable growth that um, you have lower transaction costs, uh, whether it's in time spent with the bureaucracy or in, um, yeah, in, uh, in other costs, uh, or indeed in hidden costs and hidden uh, corruption costs that such a system lowers or almost eliminates. And last but not least, that uh, the system is designed for the global market, that Estonia looks at its place in the world. Uh, as a small country, um, it needs to be um, open to the world. Um, it needs to adapt to the world and it has and it has designed its system in such a way that it has become indeed a model and an example to the world. That's something that um, where I would congratulate Estonia. This is um, it's really uh, one of the yeah one of the most heartwarming uh, examples that has come out uh, of the long dark night of communism. Um, and it's something that um, I think we can we can and should emulate because this is. Um, this is the package that we would all have to strive for. And the decision is uh, not to take a decision on this, as you say, is also a decision namely to, to mean um, that decision means we don't allow our people to take advantage of the opportunities that are there and that as Estonia has shown that work and that make our lives better. So thank you very much. These are the takeaways that I would, um, that I would like to share today. Thanks again for this enlightening presentation and for giving us so much time in your busy schedule. Thank you very much and uh, all the best uh, to all of you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, uh, Siegfried Herzog, and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, I really enjoyed it and I wish you all a nice day. <laughs> See you soon. <laughs>